All right, good afternoon, everybody. I want to take a moment to thank you. I'm going to speak loudly because we've got a microphone kind of set up over there. I assume everybody can hear my loud voice in the back. Hear me okay? Beautiful. Well, how about this? Everybody back together again. Isn't that a great feeling? Yes. So for those of you who may not know who I am, I'm Mark Hutech. I'm the CEO here of the ELC. And I've got a wonderful staff with me who most of you know, at least some of us. Um, and I want to thank all of the staff for being here today as well. Um, but it's certainly been a trying year, hasn't it? Yes, it has. And we have been along the walk and the ride and the crying and, and everything else that's gone along with this year. We've been there with you. Um, so we want you to know that we're going to continue to be along your side. It's, it's a trying time, and we're going to talk about some things today, hopefully, that lifts your spirits more than puts a damper on them, because we do have some nice things coming down the pike. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to just take a moment. You know, this has been a year that probably every one of us would probably say we've never seen anything like it, uh, not just with the economy, but between the health issues of COVID and the other things that have happened. You know, we've got providers that were here with us two years ago that aren't with us any longer, and it's not because they had their system, their, their businesses shut down. We've lost providers to COVID. We've lost providers to tragedies over the year. We've lost family members to COVID. We've lost friends. We've lost families of our children. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a rough ride. And before we get started, I would love to just take a moment uh, for us to just kind of reflect amongst ourselves, uh, just, just a little bit of gratefulness for a moment of silence and to think about maybe some of the friends and family that are no longer with us based on all of the horrible things that have happened over the last year or two. So if you would, just have a moment of silence. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. It's been a trying year, like I said, so we're gonna get through it. We're gonna continue to push on. We, uh, we obviously recognize how important it is to keep everybody safe, and hopefully we continue to remain on the downswing and this Omicron virus doesn't take over in any particular way. But, uh, you know, that's one thing that I've really appreciated and you all know is just the, uh, the attention to detail over the last year and a half and doing what we needed to do to keep our families and our children safe. It's been amazing and you all have done a fantastic job. Um, I can't tell you how many times as a CEO I've been involved with conversations at the state level, whether it was with legislators, whether it was with the Office of Early Learning, now known as the Department of Early Learning, uh, just making sure that everybody understands that Many of the real heroes in our community certainly are the work that you all provide. And if it weren't for the services that we provide and you provide, much of the world certainly would not have happened the way that it has. So it, it comes out regularly. Everybody recognizes it. And one of the great things that I think it has shown, even though there were some works in the mix prior to COVID, was an understanding of how relevant this profession is to our community, to our state, to our nation. And one of the big pieces that is evident of that, not just from the millions and millions of dollars that we've gotten and the state has gotten for the COVID relief grants and those kinds of things, but just the talk that's out there. You know, right now the state of Florida has already received $1.5 billion for the upcoming 18 months to help support getting this program and these, these organizations, you all, us, all of the childcare industry and the early learning programs, VPK, early childhood education, all of that early childhood piece has already been allocated $1.5 billion, which is comparable to about an annual budget. The state of Florida spends about $1.5 billion a year on this, which is where the ELCs, all 30 of the ELCs across the state get their funding they, they, get, they work on about a $1.5 billion budget. Well, the feds have come in and said, we're gonna give you another $1.5 billion budget for the next 18 months. So the state is still in the process of trying to figure out how that money is gonna come down the pipe to help you all sustain and get, re, get reacclimated to a new world. 
And what can we do as uh, early learning professionals to make substantial improvements so that this field is looked at uh, in a little bit better of a way? And we know that one of the things that we're all looking for is manpower. I mean, we know that that seems to be one of the biggest glitches right now. We know the situation with money. We know the situation with wages in our community. We know how difficult it is for us to find qualified workers that are willing to work at this rate. And the, the, certainly the sentiment at the state level is we've got to do something with wages. So don't be surprised if over the next year or 18 months there are some directives that will come down that will probably involve putting more money into the system so you can pay more money out of the system for wages because we recognize that that is a critical piece. So there's a lot of good things coming. The state of Florida has truly recognized, whether you're a Ron DeSantis fan or not a Ron DeSantis fan, his wife is certainly very much advocating for young children. They are a younger couple with a younger family, and they recognize, uh, very often, they recognize how relevant early childhood is. So whatever your political, your, your political uh, feelings are towards the state or towards any of the politicians that we work with or work under, one thing that is looking up for the state of Florida is the recognition that something has to change in the industry. And they're looking at it and changing in a very positive way. So I do see good things on the horizon. I know we're still kind of in this lifeboat right now trying to pull ourselves forward. Uh, we will continue to do everything we can as quickly as we can to support you in those measures. But uh, I want you to know I, I, I truly believe better things are coming in the next year or two. And I think there are going to be some significant changes made. So on that note, uh, it, it is a, a hopeful, and, and I think things will get better. Um, you know, as the job market continues to improve and parents continue to start looking to go back to work, we're hoping that this idea that the whole world has gone to Zoom and their children are staying home is starting to change. Many of your places, you know, now we're dealing more with the, what appears to be the manpower issues uh, to, to get children in places. Um, but we're going to talk about some things today. I know we're really going to get pushing the, uh, the infant, infant care piece, and I'm sure Cheryl and her team will talk about that some. Um, but we've got a lot of good things going, and I want you to feel positive about that. And uh, like I said, we're going to do everything we can to walk by your side and support you every way we can every step of the way. So on that note, I'm going to get ready to pass it on. But before I pass it on, I'm going to show you uh, just a quick video of what your leadership team from the ELC, there's five of us if you don't know, Cheryl, Diane, John, Kenneth, and myself, uh, got roped into in trying to raise money for the ELC. So whether they twisted our arm or whatever, here's a brief opportunity to see how talented your leadership team with the ELC really is.
two hours of great fun. And the only reason we wanted to make sure that you saw it was because when this thing rolls around next year, we would love to have some of your teams involved. And that would be a great time to think about it. And uh, if you don't get involved to actually participate, we would love to have you come watch the show and be a part of the family. So it was a lot of fun. We enjoyed it. And uh, I do work with some very talented people. Although, I got to tell you, the, the police department and the fire department guys, talk about hams, right? <laughs> Those guys, I'm surprised they didn't break their own necks out there doing some of the stuff that they've done. So anyway, we're glad that you're with us today, and we're going to have a lot of great information for you. So I'm going to pass it on to Cheryl Kelly and Nancy Moses. I guess I'll use the mic. My feet better. I'm not sure if I come out enough without it. I probably am, but <laughs> all right. So a few things, and it's not up on the agenda. So in regard to school readiness, first of all, I have to say it's so good to see everyone face to face. Yay! I get so excited. <laughs> well, you get to hug many of you. It was so good. Um, in regard to school readiness, um, lots of things we could talk about. There's just so much going on, right? And it's not on the agenda, but Mark mentioned it, so I don't want to not go over. Infant toddler, we have a lot of things happening with infant toddler. And we, what I really want to say is we've heard you. Um, we know that, like Mark said, there's a teacher shortage, and we know that's a huge issue right now. Um, I think if we had the answer, we would fix it, right, quickly. But more than anything, um, working with Diane and the family services staff, we understand there is a critical need for infant care in the county. There's a huge shortage. We have parents who are um, basically eligible for the program, but can't find a place to um, place their infants. So we'll put it back out again to say, if anyone is looking at the possibility, if you have space, and you're looking at the possibility of opening an infant room, we would love to talk to you um, today uh, before you leave, if we could. We are going to put out another infant toddler expansion grant. Last year we did this, where we are able to provide, um, if you got one last year, anybody in here got the infant toddler expansion grant last year? A few of you are here today, awesome. So we're gonna do another round of grants this year. So we have, we can do about six more sites where we help with the materials, um, the furnishings and materials to help you start up a room. And so we'll be putting that out again soon. Um, and again, so just be thinking because as soon as you see the information, you'll need to respond to that grant. Um, we have, well, we do have the year, the, the fiscal year to kind of get that done, but the sooner the better, obviously. So um, you'll, you will be seeing information in, in your email about that. Also, um, I'm not, I don't think she's here today, but Debbie Hurst, um, who is on our staff, who's been a quality specialist for a long time, a little bit of change in roles this year with um, some of our quality staff, of some, as some of you have probably noticed. Um, but Debbie um, is specifically now, her work is uh, to be our infant toddler specialist. And so she is available um, to anybody who, um, whether you've had an infant toddler, you know, been serving infants and toddlers for a long time or if it's something new for you we we have um, Debbie's available to help you out with whatever it is you might need training technical assistance on those topics and then the rest of the staff can still help as well but I just wanted to put out there that we are looking specifically at this age group and trying to do more because we know there's a need um, so and I'm really big about the the babies everywhere we go I want to talk about the babies I always say, years ago, I feel like BPK came along and somehow we forgot about our birth to three population, um, but really it starts at birth. So we need to really be looking back at that. And we've been fortunate to see that the state of Florida has put funds, specific funds. Those funds have gone up. I'm looking at John, I think. Um, over the years, we used to have a lot of infant toddler funds. When I first started 21 years ago, I was hired as an infant toddler specialist, and then that went away. And then it kind of has made its way back. So that's good news for all of you, um, as again, we want to see more happen with that, with that group, specifically the infants and the one-year-olds um, is what we need space for right now. So moving on, I'm going to talk a little bit about child screening. 
So all school readiness providers, you are all, you've heard us probably say this over and over, when we talk about the ages and stages, and you've probably seen a lot of emails and a lot of changes um, that have been occurring, well, earlier this year in April, we started doing the ASQs in, you know, using a new system right in the portal. And then now, as of October 31st, um, there's been, or sorry, October 3rd, there's been a change with the ASQSE and the social emotional um, tool. That tool is now required in school readiness. So um, it, it is more um, if a parent, a parent has to consent to both the ASQ3 and the SE, um, depending on how they answer the question to those screening tools will depend on whether or not you are prompted as a provider in the system to complete a screening. Um, if you have questions about any of that, Today, um, Michelle Torres is here, and um, she's in the back, she can wave her hand, and she will be happy to help you afterwards if you have any questions about any of that. Michelle works out of the Lakeland office, and then you all from the east side of the county, you know Sasha Sanchez, she is our screening specialist um, in the Winter Haven office on the east side of the county, she's not able to be here today. Um, but either one of those ladies can help you if you have questions about those new requirements and how that works. Also in your packet, you do have, um, I think, the procedures for how to complete or submit the ASQs in the portal. Um, so there's kind of a step-by-step -step in there. If you um, need assistance with that, hopefully that handout will help you out. Um, but again, we're here to help you if you need help with that. Michelle also today, um, afterwards, she has brought copies, hard copies, if anyone would like a hard copy. We didn't print enough for everyone, um, but of the, the social emotional tools, she's brought copies of those. And so afterwards, she'll be available outside um, if first come, first serve. And then she'll take a sign up if um, we need more copies, we'll get them to you. Um, but you would access the ASQ SE online. If you need a hard copy, again, please see Michelle afterwards and she'll get you what you need. All right. Any questions about that? You can print those too. You can, yes, yes. All right. Moving on to Teaching Strategies Gold. Thank you again to those of you who participate in child assessment under the School Readiness Program using Gold. We continue to be um, really fortunate here in Polk County that we, our board, um, has agreed to continue to fund the child assessment piece with GOLD. So if you are a school readiness provider and you are not participating in Teaching Strategies GOLD already and you're willing to do that, there is um, a 5% differential per child if you participate in the program um, for each subsidized child. Um, please see Kristen afterwards. You do have a little bit of a handout. I don't have that one with me, but that also is in your packet. And Kristen Granite in the back is here, Kristen oversees uh, Teaching Strategies Gold and all things related, so <laughs> please see her afterwards also if you have any questions about that. The next big thing uh, is the class assessments, right, under school readiness. We'll talk about BPK in a little while, because that will be coming soon, but school readiness class assessments, how many of you have already been assessed for this year? Raise your hand real high. We've been out. Our staff have been out there, and we're also working with the Florida Children's Forum. Um, so you may see some other folks coming out and doing those assessments. I want to say thank you to all of you for um, working so closely with us to make those happen. Melinda, um, who again is not able to be here today, but everyone I think knows Melinda too, Cantrell, she schedules those, and there are so many. After everything we've been through with COVID, and we kind of had a hold, on class, right? Now we're back in, and we have to meet the requirements that we're held to to get those all done for this year. And so when she's contacting you to schedule those, we just ask that you continue to work with us. We, we understand that sometimes the timing may not be right, but you know she'll typically talk to you about a window of time, um, and then somebody will reach out and give you your actual window once that's scheduled. But once you receive an email to say, hey, we need to get that done, we hope that you know, you'll work alongside us. If you have something that is, you know, hey, it's just not gonna work, if something really important going on, please call us, we'll do our best to work with you. But we have, again, until the end of the fiscal year to get all of the providers done 
with all of those classrooms, there's a lot to be done. <laughs> so thank you for working with us on that. And then Nancy, anything else related to that that you want to add? Right, everyone knows what we mean by QPS. Everyone should know by now, right? Quality performance system. So related to what Cheryl said about your class assessments, what you put in the QPS system for your classroom information and your teacher information is how we know who to go assess. You tell us uh, what age group that classroom serves, you tell us who's in there, and we use that information to set up the assessments. So please, please, please keep it very updated. Um, once a month, you have to submit that roster, right? Everyone knows that now, right? Every month you're gonna go in, you're gonna submit the roster. It's tempting to just click the submit button, but what we really want you to do is look it over, make sure it's right, make any changes, and then the submit button. You are welcome to make changes every single day. You don't have to submit the roster every single day, but we don't want you to wait until the end of the month to make changes. If they're happening, make the changes. The other thing I would say if you have a VPK classroom is they need to match. What you have in your VPK system for your classroom needs to match what you have in your QPS system for that classroom. Sometimes those come down and they don't match at all and then that's a, a little bit of a something we gotta work out. So meaning, just, meaning whoever's on yeah. listed as the instructor for VPK needs to be what's in QPS on the school readiness the side. Right? Yes. So both sides. And remember, we just look for instructional staff. So your teachers, uh, your lead, and your assistant teachers. We don't worry about floaters and subs in there, right? Any questions about QPS? You all really have been fantastic about it. We hardly ever have to even reach out anymore, so it's been great. Everybody seems to know that. Good. Yeah. One other thing. Um, you're, everybody's doing an awesome job with class. We are seeing the scores go up, and so, I do want to say, for those of you who are taking some of the trainings, sending your staff to trainings um, that the coalition is offering, um, it's just, we're seeing major improvements. So congratulations. If you get an email, we've had a couple of providers call. I'll, I'll get a call every now and then, and it'll say, I got an email that said, here's my composite score. And now it says um, something about a biennial provider, and they're like worried that that was like something bad. But that's something good. It means that you've gotten, <laughs> don't laugh, Terry. <laughs> Not talking about you. <laughs> um, but but if, if, if you haven't been deemed an, a biennial provider before, you wouldn't know what that means. It means that you've scored a composite score of 5.0 or higher, which means you only have to be assessed every other year, um, which is fantastic. It means your, your staff, those that have been assessed, are doing an awesome job. Um, and we want to maintain that or go higher from that point on. Um, there are some glitches right now that if you're a biennial provider, you have to be really careful with the way the rule is written um, about maintaining staff. You don't want to have staff turnover, and you, don't, you want to avoid DCF class violations because um, those two things can put you back on an, you know, an immediate new assessment or an annual assessment. Um, but in any case, we want to um, congratulate those who have scored you know, into that like range and hope that we can continue, like I said, to see those scores continue to go up. Any questions about class? We know that's a big, a big part of now the school readiness program and soon to be VPK. One other thing before I step away um, and turn it back over to Nancy, we're gonna, uh, I wanna talk about um, some PDG mental health funds, so preschool development grant. Um, as Mark said, there's been a lot of money flowing in uh, across the state and into the coalitions. Um, to get out to you all in different ways. And the preschool development grant was something that um, we were awarded as a state last year for the first time and then now uh, for a second time this year. So there were two, two sides to preschool development grant last year. One kind of fell under what we called the mental health grant and one was a curriculum grant. So we did a lot of training and things that fell under curriculum and the same thing under mental health. Well, the mental health, we've got a new allocation this year, and so we're going to be doing a few things, again, related to training, mostly. Um, and there is a tight timeline in spending these funds as it stands as of today. Um, and so we have to uh, do some things before December 31st. And we're already, what, December 6th today? <laughs> So, um, Sheila may have a few more words to say on this, um, but the, this Saturday, uh, we have sent out flyers, continue to watch your email, we have some folks registered. We did say one person per site, but we have a, it's called Pyramid Model, the Pyramid Model um, kit from Discovery Source. 
it's tied to the calming kit. It's like the next level. Um, so for those of you who did any training with the calming kits last year by Discovery Source, this is sort of the next thing building on that. Um, and it's based off of the pyramid model, if you're familiar with that. So Saturday in the coalition office in Lakeland, we're doing two sessions, one from 8.30 to 11, the other from 12 to 2.30. And we did say one person, we will take up to two people, but you'll get one kit per site. Um, and we'd like to fill those trainings. We have a lot of space in that room. And so we would love to get um, you or your staff involved in that training. Please see us afterwards, talk to Sheila. You will have to register through our learning management system, but we wanna make sure we really get the word out there on that, okay? Sheila, did I miss anything? No, that was perfect. So please register. And this training is open to school readiness VPK and VPK only providers. Yes. So if you are a VPK only provider, there's information in your packet on how to log in to our LMS system and create an account. So do that, go in, create your account, register for either the morning or the afternoon, and get a pyramid kit. It's good stuff. Good stuff, yes. Okay, Nancy, I'm going to turn it back over to you to talk about the grades. Okay. Most of you, all but one of our contractor providers have successfully completed your uh, phase six grant application, which is the biggest amount that we've had yet. You all know what I'm talking about. You did this grant, you filled it out online, right? It's pretty simple, right? We made it very easy for you. It was in that same web author system that Sheila just mentioned. So if you successfully completed that grant, which you did, then you can successfully log in and select that training. That grant is really, um, it's tied, I want to mention it in relation to that disaster relief payment. So that is the one that a couple months ago, you all were asked to uh, fill in information about your staff and they each received a thousand dollar check from the state of Florida mailed to their home. You all remember that? I think that they were really excited about that. That was a huge boon for them. It went directly to them. It was thanking them individually for the work that they did, right? This next one, what we're doing now, this phase six, is another way to support you and support your staff um, with a little more wiggle room for you about how you spend that. So you'll see there's amounts, depending on your capacity amounts uh, for your staff. But I think the key to this is, Cheryl mentioned check your email a couple times, and that's the key. That's how we get this information to you. So if you're not regularly seeing our emails, maybe you need, sometimes they go into like your junk mail or something like that, so you might need to just kind of tweak that a little bit. But that is the main way that we're gonna get this information to you and we don't want you to miss it because starting in January, we're gonna go back and do that disaster relief grant again for your staff. The state of Florida is doing another round, another thousand dollars, but you gotta go in and complete that application. It should be easier this time because you have already done it. You should be able to log right back in. All the stuff should be in there. It should be pretty simple. But you gotta watch your email to know when that opens and when that's available, okay? Does anyone have any questions about that grant? I know that uh, John and Lee are getting ready to do a big processing, a big payment for that. We expect hopefully this week or so. Um, to get that out to you, and I know you guys have been great about getting that done and getting everything in. Anyone have any questions about the grants? Anything coming? Is it serving you well? We love to hear the stories. If you, if you have stories, you know, you get those checks, or you get those payments, all of those good stories about what you do with that money, we would love to hear that. If you can send us an email, you can call Linda, she's our marketing manager, you can hear from her later. We do love to hear those stories because just fun, just fun. All right, um, I think we're on to VPK, sure. Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Good afternoon. I have quite a bit um, updates on VPK. Let me make sure. Okay. First thing, um, I know we've been sending out emails weekly with um, some of the new training requirements, increased training requirements for emergent literacy. So um, just make sure you continue to check your email. Those emails have been coming from Karen Hallman, but you'll also see in your little handout um, pamphlet that you have 
the memos that have been sent out, which is the frequently asked questions and then the memo about the increased training. Um, I just wanted to read something to you real quick just to remind you all of um, just some deadlines. So as far as the increased VPK training goes, the training is required of all VPK leads. I know it says instructors, but it's just for the leads. If you have assistants and they want to go ahead and take the training, by all means, I would encourage them to do it. Just in case you have a teacher, a lead that leaves, you may need to put um, that assistant as a lead or you need to hire someone else and you have subs. Encourage them to go ahead and get the training done. The trainings do have to be completed by July 1st, 2022. But I will say in order to contract, you do your lead does have to have those trainings already completed by the time you submit your contract. So you have until now to July 1st, but if you're trying to contract, and you know contract season usually starts in the spring, March, April, go ahead and have your teachers start registering for those trainings. They're available online. You'll see in the memo, there's a couple trainings online. There's a few that are offered through Early Learning Florida, and then there is the reading endorsement, which is for certified teachers who have the educator certificate. The other thing with the increased emergent literacy training is that your leads also have to have the newest performance standards. So you know the standards for four-year-olds, they were able to get by with that training um, to meet the training requirements, but all teachers, all leads now have to have the new training which is implementing the Florida standards in preschool classrooms, three-year-old to kindergarten. So no matter if, what degree they have, if they have a certification, they are all required to complete the emergent literacy trainings, which is the three five-hour trainings, and then they're also required to complete the new performance standards. Any questions about that? Yes, ma'am. We are working on, with Terry, I'm working with her to get a list compiled of what would meet that requirement. So I know as far as like what, I know there's different endorsements under the reading that would meet that uh, requirement, but she's working with Dale now to get a list, a compromised list of, um, of what would meet the requirements for the reading endorsement. She's working with Dale, and I know Dale is working on comp uh, composing a list of the ones that would be the requirement. So as soon as she gives me information, I'll be sure to share it with you, because I know that really affects you and the teachers, yes. Oh, one other thing, on the memo, if you will notice that, um, I know a lot of your teachers have already taken emergent literacy, some have already taken um, language and vocabulary and phonological awareness. I will tell you that there are dates on page six of the frequently asked question, it's four or six, I believe it's four, that tells you if the teachers took the training before those dates, it does not meet the training requirements. So they would have had to take the newest emergent literacy and the newest language or vocabulary to meet those requirements. And then phonological awareness, if they took that training previously, the old one does not count. So they have to take the new one listed on that list if they choose to use those trainings to meet the training requirements. But there are other ways that they can meet the training requirements if they choose to. If any teachers took the, I think it's building blocks and preschool development through Early Learning Florida, those dates are also listed on page four of um, when they would have had to have completed those trainings for it to count. So please pay attention to those dates. Don't just look at their transcript and say, oh, they have emergent literacy, they're done. They have to have it after those specific dates. And I will tell you, um, the Department of Children and Families is working in their training system to make sure that on your transcripts, once they complete the 15 hours, it's going to give you a notice that says that the instructor has completed the 15 hours. So you will know by the transcript that whether they've completed it or not. If they complete reading endorsements, it will not show up on the transcript. If they completed the Early Learning Florida, they're working for that to show up on transcripts. But if they completed those trainings, you can um, submit the certificate, the completion certificate when you do your um, BPK applications and submit for 22-23. Don't start uploading transcripts right now. Wait until you all, because that's just going to put your, your BPK apps in um, submission, and we're just going to be reviewing. Just hold on to those if you have updated transcripts that show the completed trainings, and then when you get ready to submit your BPK apps for 22-23, go ahead and <coughs> upload those, um, because we're all going to be checking before we certify your contract. Okay. Oh, I have one other thing on credentials. So with the new rule 
am. Let me make sure I get the label. Rule 6M-8.610 now um, states, and we're waiting on Dell to, um, Division of Early Learning, I keep saying Dell, DL, but we're waiting on them to send out a memo, but just know all VPK directors have to be VPK endorsed. So I know we have a couple VPK um, directors who are currently exempt, but you are now required to complete the endorsement. There is six trainings that you would have to complete in order to get the endorsement. If you're exempt and you're not sure, you can give me a call, um, email me, and I'll go over your transcript with you to let you know what trainings you need to complete in order to get that endorsement. As far as the deadline date, we don't have that just yet. So stay tuned. As soon as we get um, guidance from um, Dell, I'll send that out to you all so you have it. But if you know you have an exempt, I will start working on making sure that you meet all the training requirements to get the endorsement. Next, readiness rates. It's a fun topic. So for the 21-22 program year, which was last year, you know the readiness rates are always released a year after the program year. We, there will be no negative impact for the readiness rates that are released this year. And I will tell you, they are going to be released this year. Um, usually, preliminaries is usually December, early January, and then the final readiness rate is usually springtime, March, April, depends on um, Dell and how they finish calculating all the um, readiness rates. But there will be no negative um, impact for anyone. If you are currently a provider on probation, you have the opportunity to come off of probation if you meet the readiness rate which is a 60 or above. If you do not meet that 60 or above and you're provided probation, you will remain on probation. The only way to come off of probation is to meet the readiness rate. So um, just know that there'll be no negative impact and then you, the, your years will not change. So if you're currently a year one, you'll remain a year one if you don't meet the readiness rate. Any questions about that this year? Okay. For 21-22, let me back up. So this year is going to be the last year that you all are going to implement the VPK assessment, AP1, AP2, and AP3. That is going away. But there is going to be a new assessment tool that replaces the um, VPK assessments. Right now, we don't know what the actual tool is going to be, but um, Division of Early Learning is hoping to release that in March, hopefully March, we'll see. And then after we know what the new tool is, you'll still be implementing it um, beginning of the school year, mid and the end of the school year. It'll just be um, a new tool, it'll no longer be the VPK assessment, and you'll be implementing that in your classroom. With that being said, though the new assessment that you're gonna be using, that will also be used to calculate your readiness rate in addition to your VPK class score, which Cheryl's gonna to touch on. I'm not gonna to touch on that right now. But just know, I know you all are used to the children being assessed when they get to kindergarten, the first 30 days, that will no longer happen. It will be done now in your VPK classroom. So it'll be used um, with the new assessment tools, with the um, pre, mid, and post. We don't know the tool yet, but as soon as we know, we will let you know, and then, of course, with the new tool comes training. So um, just be prepared and know that when that tool comes out, we, um, they will be offering training so that you and your teachers are um, able to administer that new screening tool. That's all I have now for, uh-oh. Oh, just one reminder with VPK monitoring, we are out monitoring. Uh, I know we were doing it virtual last year. Some of you may still receive a virtual monitoring, just depending on, maybe it's going dead, I don't know. Um, depending on uh, the time frame of the year, but just if you have not been monitored yet, please know that you will be monitored and we will be out to monitor you. Um, I'll be out, Matamatha and Cynthia. So just make sure with your sign in and out sheets that your parents or an authorized um, person is signing the children in and out, not you as the provider. It has to be the parent or authorized um, contact person that's able to pick up and drop off the child. I 
I think that's all for me. Any questions about any of those three things I discussed? In the back, Ashley. Oh, yes. I have a question about sign language option. Okay. We're on the school grounds, and some of the schools do not allow parents in to sign the book. So some of our schools write the parents' name in the sign language option. Are we not allowed to do that? You, it, you're going to have to find a way that the parent has to, because it's written in rule that the parent or authorized person has to sign the child in. It cannot be the provider. Okay. Yeah. Can you see me afterwards and we'll see what I can do to help you? We'll sign the Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I have a question about that. I got two. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Same, it's on the same topic. Okay. So if we're using like smart care to sign them in, that's the parent signing them in. As long as they're using their code or whatever you give them to sign the child in electronically, that's fine. Okay. It just has to be them and not us when we see your printout that you've signed them in using whatever you do to sign them in. So it should show that the parent's name is attached to whatever their code is when they sign them in and out. And that is okay if you are the great parent of the children. You can sign As long as you're authorized and you're on their paperwork to sign them in and out, yes ma'am. What you did, which is fine. That's fine, because there will be no other way, unless you just, if you have a paper signing out for that day, and then you go back and have the parents sign in, but we have to have the parents' signature on there, so that's fine. I have one hand over here real quick. Yes. Starting in January, January of this year. If you've had a virtual monitoring, that will be your monitoring. But if you haven't had a virtual or in person, you still are due for a VPK monitoring. Did I see? Yes. Okay, I also use Bright Blue. Mm -hmm. And I um, have a question. Do you have to Not just for our sake, but your sake and being DCF licensed or whoever you're licensed under, I would suggest having them sign something in paper if you need to have a sheet just for that day. And then when they come back, have them sign it, but you need to have record that the child has been signed in that day. What I'm saying on that paper, you can print it out. Yeah, you can, oh, if you're printing it out and have them, as long as you, yes, that's fine. they can sign it when they come in, like she said, she. Yes. Okay. Just don't leave anything blank, yes. Yes, you need to have them sign it in somewhere if it's paper or you print it out and sign it. Was there a hand in the back? No? Nothing else? All right. If you ever have any questions about VPK, don't hesitate to call or email. All right. All right. So just really quick, <laughs> I'm talking about class. Um, uh, so most, most of those of you here today, most of you have been, um, again, working with class. And, and we've been coming in and doing class assessments for a little while now. But um, House Bill 419 passed um, not very long ago. And so now for VPK sites that don't offer school readiness, um, we will be learning more about class, right? The opportunity to participate in class. Um, and so if you're not familiar with what class is, class is um, a program assessment tool where we look at um, teacher-child interactions. Um, the assessments take about, how long, ladies? Three hours, two hours? Four cycles, it's, uh, we are required to do four cycles in a class observation where the assessor is in the room um, observing and, and can step in and out if they need to. Um, I'm not a class assessor, but we have plenty of class assessors on staff. Um, but we are the biggest thing for VPK um, providers, and that's everybody, whether you do school readiness and VPK or only VPK, is to understand that moving forward into next fiscal year, every VPK classroom will be class assessed. 100% of VPK classrooms. So, 
If you're a, a provider doing both programs, we're not exactly sure what that looks like. We're still waiting for more information from the Division of Early Learning because we have that QPS system. Um, we know that oftentimes your, cla your um, BBK classroom or one of them, if you have multiple classrooms, is often assessed as part of the um, percentage of classrooms that's pulled under school readiness for observation. Moving forward, it's 100% sure that your BPK classrooms will be assessed. So what that means for this year is if, if your VPK teachers are not familiar with class, training needs to occur before July 1st, before we move into that new uh, fiscal year. And so in order to get everyone ready, we are going to be working real hard to offer a lot of training. And so for those who are VPK only, meaning that's the only contract you have with us, please know that your sites will have priority in some of the trainings that we are getting ready to offer beginning soon, very soon, and Sheila's shaking her head. She has more dates and more information available. Um, we're gonna try to offer some trainings, maybe even just for you all, um, and then others that will open up to everyone, make sure the trainings are filled. But this is the time to, to get in, to really learn the ins, in, ins and outs of the tool. There's a lot to it and there's a lot to understand. We do know that everybody wants to do the best that they can on class. As Ashley said, the class score will be part of that school readiness or that readiness rate for your site. So the child assessment piece and the program assessment piece are both gonna be part of calculating the readiness rate. So it's real important. There's gonna be a lot more information to come, a lot more on training, but Sheila, did you wanna comment real quick on just a couple of the things we have coming up? Yes, yes. We have options as well. We're going to have some virtual and we'll have face-to-face. -face. Just to accommodate everybody's needs, we'll have January 8th, we're having an overview of pre-K in our Lakeland office. And then we've got January 11th, overview of language modeling, which will be virtual. In your packet, you have a blue a sheet. A blue sheet. Yep, that's got trainings and dates on it. And all you'll have to do is register through our learning management system. And so we have a lot. We've got a, this whole front page <coughs> are all class-related trainings. And, and, and again, going back to what we said earlier, thank you, Sheila, um, we will be working closely with um, Division of Early Learning because they are planning to put a lot of trainings out as well virtually. Um, we'll be working with Terry, who is our regional facilitator from the Division of Early Learning um, in the VPK program, closely with her. And lots coming down via email. So all of these things will be put in our LMS, but if you're not paying attention to those emails, then you might miss one or something might fill up or that kind of thing. It's gonna be, like I said, a lot of work, but um, I would say go ahead and start preparing those VPK teachers because it is 100% um, um, we're sure that they will be assessed. Sometimes everybody goes, I wonder if my classroom will be or won't. Those teachers can, can know that they will be. Go ahead. So there isn't a requirement necessarily, that's a great question, so if you're not familiar with class, there isn't necessarily a requirement as far as the training and even on the VBK side at this point, as far as I know, there is no requirement for the number of trainings or what you need to take, um, but there are all different topics. We, when, when she was talking about the different ones that we're going to offer there as overviews, we're breaking the tool down into the different sections of the tool, the different dimensions that are in the tool. Um, so we'll do that often, but there is what's called, um, used to be called um, MMCI, Making the Most of Classroom Interactions. It's now called Class Group Coaching, and that's a, um, a longer training, 20, for 20 hours for pre-K, 24. and 24 for uh, infant toddler, I always have to remember, um, that is um, a very in-depth training that I would encourage everyone to take. The issue with the class group coaching is, number one, we only have so many trainers. We have more in Polk County than many coalitions do, so we're really fortunate. However, the Teach Stone, who um, they're the ones that um, have published class, 
they limit the number of people who can be in a training. So we have to follow that, which means the class size is really small, which is great for the trainer. However, it means we have to do more trainings in order to accommodate a lot of teachers. So again, be watching because we're gonna be trying to get more and more pre-K class group coaching um, and those other trainings out there for everyone. And Cheryl, we do have a class group coaching. Blanca is starting one in January. And if you would like to look in our Ellen Mac section, there are classes that are being offered in January. And if you look in our LMS system, you will see not just what's listed on your blue sheet, what's on your blue sheet. These are December through February. So if you log into LMS, we have trainings scheduled. All of them are aligned with class through June. So you can go in and register for whatever you would like to take. Blanca is starting classroom coaching in January. That training is already in our LMS. You can look at the dates and times. And then I will be starting one right around March, just so we can stagger to accommodate you. So check our LMS. You'll see a lot of great stuff coming. The LMS is the web office portal. Yes. The learning management system is web author. Sorry, we have all of these abbreviations and things we need to keep up with here. Any other questions about class, program assessment, anything VPK related? Okay, I will say, um, oh, go ahead, Ashley. Is there another question on this side? Yes. Well, we don't have a, a really great organized like um, booklet or things of training yet, but we're working on it. And again, a part of that is we're working with the state and trying to see what they're going to offer versus what we need to offer locally. So as soon as we can kind of get it together and organize it in a fashion to where you can see what's available virtually, um, you know, and self-paced versus something that we're doing, we will get that out to you. We are working on it. That's a good question. Okay. All right. I think that's it then. Oh, the last thing I wanted to mention, um, you know, this all, this all came about, um, everything related to House Bill 419 and all of these changes, just like everything does in what we do, right? So um, there's rules that are promulgated and they have to go through a process. And, and during that process, there's always, um, the state offers um, rulemaking workshops and times for um, coalitions and providers, um, anybody in the field to provide input as they're going through and deciding what the new statutes are gonna look like, right? And so I wanna encourage all of you, we want to encourage all of you to um, get more involved if, if, when you can in those, in those processes. It's great um, that, that we as coalition staff, we love being part of those calls and we love being um, a voice on your behalf, but it's even better when you all as providers can um, you know, provide input, give feedback, when they're talking about you know different things that are coming up whether it is related to the children whether it's related to your programs or these new things so on oel's website and nancy do you want to pull that up real quick you go on and i keep saying oel del division of early learning um, when you go on their website and she's going to pull it up here um, and you go the first on the home page it'll say um, on the right hand side there's a whole list of um, options when you first pull up their website, it'll say statewide initiatives. Click on that, and then you can go to this proposed rules um, page. And when you go to this, you can sign up for those different rulemaking workshops. You can see you know, the status of different rules and things like that. And again, I know that everyone's really busy and it sounds easier than it is sometimes, but we would love, we would love to get on those calls and hear, you know, what, what you all think about what's happening. And that's in school readiness and VPK. Okay? All right. Thanks so much. Excuse me. In regards to her question, we can also set all of the teachers up with a TeachStone account. And oh. they can do small That's a great point. Um, good question about training. There is, um, we can set you up if you don't already have one. 
with a TeachStone account. There are trainings that TeachStone themselves offer online, and so if you have not done that before, you know, talk with one of us after one of the quality staff. We can get names and numbers, and um, Melinda typically, I think, can get back to you with more information on that. Yeah, or reach out to your quality specialist. Sounds great. All right, I think Diane's next. Well, as Cheryl said earlier, it is good to see all of you in person again. It's been so long. Um, me, I didn't do well, I guess it was my bottom, it was the fall. Um, <laughs> but I'm here. Um, I just want to talk a little bit. Yes, we do need infant care. Please, anybody. <laughs> Infants, please. We have parents that have to comply with other programs and we can't find a spot for those parents especially in your Lake Wales area and out that way, especially out in Haines City. Very big need for infant care. Of course, in toddlers, right after that. <laughs> um, we have been enrolling, as you know. Um, along with that, we need to make sure we're keeping our numbers where they need to be. So we need to keep our enroll numbers matching our paid numbers. So what we're asking you, if you know you don't have a child attending, hasn't attended for a while, we enrolled a new child in your site, child didn't show up, please go into your um, queue and um, terminate that child on your side. We follow through with them, we'll follow up with the parent. We run lists all the time, and I'm calling the parents, trying to find out what's going on with the children and if there is still a need. Um, when we have so many children enrolled and then our payments are low, it kind of skews all our numbers and it makes it a little more difficult for us to determine how many children we actually need to enroll in care. So that's important. And one note on that, if you have a child that falls under the Ryla Wilson Act, everybody should be able to know which children they are. You can look at that under your manage um, queue. Under view enrollment, you should know. You should keep a track of that. It's important. Those children, we cannot just terminate. Those children, we need to be aware of if they're missing a day and you haven't heard from the parent or the foster parent, you don't have anything in writing. I've been um, cited from the ELC um, when they've got done attendance monitorings. We've also had one from when the um, DEL did a monitoring for us, so it's important you let us know you have something in writing to back up the reason why that child is not in care. If you haven't heard, let us know. We'll reach out to the parent, we'll reach out to the caregiver, um, and let them know as well. Those children are very important to make sure they are attending your site. So if you have children that fall under that Bryla Wilson Act and they have not been attending, please let us know. Um, I'm, on your agenda, we did put all the managers' names and that's their direct phone number, okay? Um, in each area, each manager, in each office, we now have one out in Lake Wales, yay! That's Mark Hargraves, he's here with us today. He's visiting with us today. So um, if you have any questions and you're out in that area, feel free to call him. That's their direct phone line, okay? Um, let me see. I think that's all I went through. Protective service, school readiness, termination. It's very important on those two you follow through. Please make sure you also know where to find your um, enrollment queue. If you're not sure, please contact one of the managers and they'll help you locate that queue for you, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, on some of the um, terminations from, I know mine from my end, when I go into the system to try to terminate the child, it will not allow me to do it. Okay, if you have that issue, please call one of the managers that's on the list and they can walk you through to find out what's going on. You also will be able to know, to see which children haven't signed their certificate, which parents haven't signed that certificate. All of that is under your managed queue. So, you know, if you're not familiar with where that is or how to get to it, call one of the managers and they can walk you through that, okay? Any other questions? No? All right. So I do the enrollment side. And John does the payment side, so he's going to come over and talk to you a little bit about, about the payment piece. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those that I haven't met, my name is John Patrick. I am the Chief Financial Officer for the ELC. 
Um, I oversee the budget. Uh, typically, they put me on this agenda when there's bad news to give, but that's not the case today. Um, as you've heard, and, and, and we're all trying to come out of this COVID thing, and we're all trying to uh, recover in some way, uh, the state has infused child care providers in, in this industry with millions and millions of dollars. And first off, that should just tell you how important it is what you guys do. Um, I want to just go back and touch on what Nancy was talking about, the phase six grants. That is eight and a half million dollars that we are going to put into Polk County and probably sometime this week. Yes? Oh, so by Friday you should have those, uh, those grants. And, and they range from $4,500 for the smallest uh, family child care home up to about $45,000, $48,000 dollars for the large centers. Um, my intent was to get up here and implore you to fill out those applications because this, this is, it's not hard to do and, and it's, it's money that's meant to help you in your industry. Um, in your businesses, but after talking to Nancy, it sounds like most of you have already done the application, which, good on you, that's great. And hopefully by the end of the week, we should, uh, we should have those payments out. Um, I also want to touch on the Teaching Strategies Gold. Uh, I believe the first checkpoint was October 31st, so for like the first three months of the year, that payment will be included in your school readiness payment that goes out on the 20th of November. So look for that. December. One more time. December. Thank you. December 20th. <laughs> well, it's, it's November reimbursements, and yeah, I get it confused all the time. So. Um, yeah, December 20th, that payment should be included with your school, school readiness payment. Um, so you've heard the critical need that we have for infants and toddlers. And like last year, this year we were given an allocation for provider rate increases. So the lead team did some analysis. Um, we looked at the needs of the community. We looked at the capacity we have. And there is definitely, and you heard Mark say, you heard Cheryl say, you heard Diane say, there's a critical need um, for infant and toddler care. So with that, we decided to take those funds and do a rate increase for the infants and toddlers. Now this has already gone to the board. Um, I said I wasn't going to give specifics, but it is public record. And just so you know, we are looking, and, and hopefully this is an incentive for some, along with the uh, infant and child care grants that we're doing. Uh, we're, we're looking at raising the infant rates to $50 a day, which is quite a leap considering the family child care homes was at 42 and licensed centers is at 36 right now. Um, and we're looking at increasing the toddler rates to $34 a day. Uh, that rate has already been approved by our board. It went to our board last month and it's at uh, Division of Early Learning right now waiting their approval. If that gets approved, then we're hoping that sometime early in the new year, you know, January timeframe, that we can implement those rates for the providers. Really, that's about all I had, but I'm willing to take questions on anything related to reimbursements. I did want to add to the, the rate increase. So obviously for that rate increase to take effect, once it gets approved by the Division of Royal Learning, we would have to do contract amendments to every contract that we had again this year, yay, right? Uh, so we will have to do contract amendments uh, to make sure that those rates get inputted into the system so that you can get paid those increased rates. Um, so a couple things with that. One, if we raise our infant rate to 50, but your infant rate that you still hold, your published rate, is less than that, we can only pay the max of, or the, the lowest one. So if our rate is 50, your rate is 40 per day, we can only pay you the 40 per day. So to fully take advantage of that rate increase on our side, you would have to increase your published rates as well. If you increase your published rates, then that requires a couple changes on your behalf. You'd have to change them in your provider profile, and then we would have to do a contract amendment uh, for, for you. The goal is, right, that we could do, if you wanted to do that uh, infant or toddler rate increase to, to get that maximum benefit from our rate increase, that we could do both of those rate increases at the same time. 
right? So that would, that would save us 300 amendments and you have to do two of them. So, um, you know, we, we still gotta wait for those things, to, for that to get approved by the Division of Early Learning. Once that does get approved, we can let you know. And then if you just, so, I'm just telling you this so that you can be thinking, go ahead and start thinking about, you know, if you want to increase your rates, what does that look like? To give notice to your, your parents because if you're increasing uh, your published rates, your private pay families, that's increasing their rate as well. So, you know, I, that, that's hard to do in some cases, especially given short notice. So, um, um, <laughs> but um, so I'm just letting you guys know just to go ahead and start thinking about, you know, to be able to utilize our rate increase, you would have to do that as well. And what does that look like in trying to get both of those rates increased at the same time? the same amendment so that we can get that funding out to you guys as, as soon as we can. Thanks, Kenneth. And, and yeah, there's some work on your part, but the, I mean, this is good news. This is, um, we're looking at about a $2 million increase in the budget to support this uh, rate increase. Charlie, quick question. Yes, ma'am. So I know it depends on what part of the coalition, um, like it was curriculum number of toddlers, you're talking about just one-year-olds, not one- and two-year-olds, correct? Correct. Okay. okay. Are you talking about ones or twos? It's 13 months to 24 months. So it's infant, so zero to 24 months. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, well. Or 23 and three. Right. Okay. okay, there's a difference for toddlers. And so zero and one, not two year olds. Okay. Yeah, we, we define infants and, and division of early learning does too. You know, they have care levels and infants are zero to 12 months, the toddlers are 13 to 24 months. Any more questions? Okay, well, you can always call me, you can email me, and as Kenneth said, as soon as we have the approval from Division of Early Learning, we'll, we'll move and we will send notification out to everyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, Belinda. Good afternoon, I'm Belinda Kramer and I'm the marketing manager for the ELC of Polk. And I, along with Daniel Carrion Jr., the gentleman behind the videographer over there, he helps me to shine the spotlight on what is so wonderful and positive that's happening with all of you. And I want to just thank all of you of what you do every day because it's hard from a business perspective of running a business. And then at the same time, you are shaping these future citizens. So I like to be mindful of, of that aspect of what we do with awareness and showing the positive side of early learning because it's super important. Our community a while back really didn't know a lot about what you all were doing. So um, I felt it was important with, with so many of you of what you're doing in your classrooms to shine the light. Sometimes it's something you can submit to us in social media. If you want to show me pictures of a quality lesson that you're doing, I would love to come out with Daniel to see what you're doing. And it might be something that finds its way into um, the newspaper. The ledger sometimes picks up some of these events and as well as television. So again, the spotlight is on quality learning. And um, I just was excited in October, the end of October, uh, Dr. Mark Hutek, one of his quotes um, actually made it into a headline. And it was um, about a kindness lesson that the kids were learning in honor of um, National Bullying Awareness Month. And um, one of our preschools that was at the YMCA in Lakeland actually had an event where the, a kindness quilt was put together. And uh, Dr. Hutek said, I will quote you, once a broken child becomes a broken adult, the entire community is impacted one way or another which leads you to understand how critical it is for young children to learn the appropriate behaviors of socialization, who Tex said, who wants preschoolers to learn key social emotional skills to prevent this from happening in early years of education. So there was an opportunity where we could drop in what is our mission. And the community saw it. They saw Ms. Sheila Chambers back there helping with Nancy also helping Nancy, where are you? 
Yes, you were back there helping her do that, that kindness quilt. And even the reporters were like so moved by what they saw. So when this comes out to the community, suddenly they're like, who's doing all this? Well, it's the providers, but it's also the Early Learning Coalition who's hoping to train and get those quality moments to happen. Look on our Facebook as well, because sometimes when you share pictures of what you're doing, like today's post, um, it was a wonderful post. I think it was um, Jenny's Preschool. Anybody here from Jenny's Preschool? Jeannie, sorry, Jeannie's Preschool. Jeannie? Yep. Okay, thank you for those pictures because that was a great Facebook post on how you could learn from objects that were um, living things and non-living things. And the children made pet rocks and then took them with them all through the day. But also there was a book, a book that they um, read, which was... Um, quite a, a great lesson in literacy. Early literacy is another thing that we want our community to understand that this starts from birth, reading to these children and we want to always spotlight that. So any of those things you want to share with us, anything positive that's happening in your classroom can turn into something of a bigger focus. We're about to launch into a campaign very soon. You're going to be looking at billboards and um, some of our, our city buses will have images that are promoting the importance of early learning and also the importance of uh, BPK and also school readiness funds that help for these parents to be able to pay for this child care cost that is soaring. And there's so many other things that I want to spotlight. So please remember me, Belinda Kramer. Send me an email if you want to send those pictures. Just make sure you tell me what the activity is that you're doing so I can kind of explain it a little bit because you inspire each other. You know, sharing these things maybe will inspire another provider to say, you know what, that worked well for them. I think I want to try this too, or some spin on that. So I'm happy to be your marketing specialist. I'm happy that, that Daniel is also helping with our digital graphics and all the other things that we need to get these uh, messages out there. So please reach out to me. I want to shine the spotlight on all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Belinda. And thank you to everyone who has um, been so great about responding. Sometimes we'll hear a really great story or quality specialist will hear something really positive. And so then they, they let me know and then we call you back and we say, can you put that in writing or can you send us a picture or whatever? And Belinda just runs with that. And so we want to continue to do that and put it all over social media and whatever. But a reminder to always make sure that we have um, consent for photo releases on file in all of your centers. Um, because we never want to get ourselves in a position where we um, could legally have an issue or something. So thank you for that. And last thing here, I wanted to, I'm not sure, I don't think this is in your packet, but I know that it has been emailed out. And if the, everybody's been providers a long time, I know, but um, every year we try to collect um, children's hand artwork um, as part of Children's Week. And uh, some years the legislative session is earlier than other years. But this is um, in order to um, send the handprints up to Tallahassee. Actually, we may have a few of us going up. Some, some years, a few of us actually go up there and help to hang the hands in the Capitol Rotunda. Um, and it's a symbol to our legislators and other advocates on behalf of children's issues as they are getting ready to meet and make big decisions about how important Florida's children are. So. If you would, make sure that you follow the directions that have been sent out again via email and um, as far as the way that the hands need to hang, most of you are familiar. Make sure to put really big on the hands somewhere. Um, Polk County, really big. Um, because once they're hanging, it's really nice to be able to look up and see where they've come from. The name of your site and then Polk County because they are representative of you know the entire state once they're hanging up there. But whether you're walking under or walking around the sides at the different levels if you haven't been in the Capitol, um, it's really neat and you can kind of see a little bit um, about where they come from, which is really nice. So they're due by January 14th so that we can get them up there for that last week of January for Children's Week. All right, I think that's it. At this point, I think we were going to open it for any questions, answers, just in general, about anything that we haven't covered today. No? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Oh, go ahead. Would it be possible to get a hard copy directory from ELC with your phone names, phone numbers, divisions? Jose directs
directed that. Me, right. Jose directed me to it on your website, but it would have taken about 14 pages to copy it. Yes, and you have to scroll and scroll. <laughs> there are 80 of us. So <laughs> But one thing that has happened is, is that there are many legislators around the state right now that are looking back and saying, geez, when VPK started, what is it, 16 years ago now? 2005. 2005, 16 years ago. 16 years ago, the, the, the VPK funding was about $100 a child more than it is right now. And the legislators see that. So when they start talking about some of the global changes in this industry, they're recognizing that something has to happen, you know, but they're also talking about whether or not that's gonna possibly involve higher rates, but then maybe some higher criteria for teachers as well, right? You know, there are folks out there that really believe they would love to see all VPK teachers get paid a teacher salary at $38,000, $42,000 a year, but then you're gonna question what the credential is in order for them to get that kind of a job. So it, it, it is on the table, and they are talking about it, but they haven't said at this point that they fully intend to increase the VPK rate, you know, because there's a lot of issues with VPK across the board, right? We all know that the, the assessment piece is an issue. That's about to be changed. The funding model is an issue. They're, they're looking at it. They want to change it. Um, and then not to mention the fact that you just look at, in general, the uh, kindergarten readiness rates. Right? You're talking about 50% of the children rolling into any particular school district in the state, just about. And they'll tell you that the kindergarten readiness rate is so low. Um, but we also know that there's a lot of factors that go into that. Not to mention the fact that I had a meeting with the superintendent of the school district last week, and he even said, you know, gosh, I'm just a little bit concerned because, you know, we run about 7,500 children a year coming into kindergarten. How many kids do you have coming through VPK every year? And we say, well, right now we're at about 3,980. You know, we're hoping to break 4,000 by the end of the year. What's happening to the other almost 4,000 children a year that aren't even going, that are skewing the kindergarten readiness rates? So there's a whole lot involved with that. The legislature certainly is looking at that, but we haven't gotten any information yet on what it means. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna to touch on just a couple things. Yes, Belinda has done a magnificent job in highlighting many of your programs. And I would say that each of us could probably use a little goodness to come into the media and, and all at any point in time. So if you do have something going on, even if you think maybe it's just something small, she's got a way of turning it into a great story. And she has built a wonderful rapport and reputation with the local media. You know, if you don't, if, if you ever see Fox 13, Ken Suarez is gonna be covering it for us. We just know that because she's got a direct connect to the man. We know that uh, Kimberly Moore with the Lake of Leisure loves stories involving children. So don't think that maybe something you're doing, if it's something you do once a year, that is a perfect story for her, for us to jump on and get you some publicity. Particularly if you're one of the providers that's got vacancies. If, if you have vacancies, it's a great opportunity to get your name into the media and to have a parent out there say, oh my gosh, that looks like a great place for maybe I can bring my child. So please use us for that. It's a wonderful opportunity for you and it makes everybody look good. I'm not sure if anybody today has said anything about infants and toddlers, but we are looking. So, so it is encouraging, right, the idea that we potentially are, of course, everything is pending DEL's approval, and we're not sure if all this money that's gonna come down will be reflective in any other types of rates too. For all we know, worst case scenario, they could postpone and say, no, we're not going to approve your rate increase right now because we've got other plans to do other things with other rates. It's our hope they won't do that. But if indeed this thing really does go through, and if indeed we start paying $50 a day for our infants, that's gonna be at the higher at the state level. That's gonna be one of the higher coalitions 
uh, doing that. And we're hoping that that's enough to, to make it worthwhile for many of you to start thinking about opening up that infant classroom because we are desperately looking for places for those babies. Yes? We need teachers. I understand. <laughs> well, teachers that come in and they say, I'm going to change diapers. So yes and no, right? I mean, if you start thinking ahead a little bit with the bigger picture, it's kind of like I've said, right? I've told folks at the state level, here's the deal. If you take VPK and you make it a degreed subject and you pay those VPK teachers $42,000 a year, you know where you're going to get those teachers from? You're going to get them from the elementary schools. We're going to rob Peter to pay Paul. So let's just say that you're making $50 a day now per infant and you start paying your infant teachers five dollars an hour more, where are you going to get those teachers from? You're going to rob Peter to pay Paul, unfortunately, so it's still going to be a teacher issue, but you're going to get your infant teachers. All right? So it's just one way to think about it, just put the bug out there. Yeah. Trust me, my daughter's got a three-month-old, and I saw a nasty mess yesterday. So. <laughs> Anyway, and last before we go today, I've got to tell you, you know, there are, there are times in life when you come across people that just commit themselves. And we've got a very special individual today that I would like in just a moment uh, for everybody to applaud. But we've got Maddie from the school district who has done 37 years with the school district, 44 years, 44 years. And... She is on her way out, and Maddie, if, if the world could just take the enthusiasm that you've had, you know, even when I work with you in the school district, you're a class act, and I know that everybody that I've spoken to with the coalition has said, if you ever need answers, and, and think about this, ladies and gentlemen, think about this. She's working with programs that probably support somewhere in the range of five to 7,000 children a year, at least, and multiply that times a 40-year career. Now, if that's not impactful, that's a lifelong impact. So, Maddie, we're going to wish you the best on your retirement. We appreciate all that you've done. And one more round of applause for Maddie.